in the heart of a tempestuous era, a brilliant mind emerged, destined to change the course of history. American Prometheus, the triumph and tragedy of J. Robert Oppenheimer. A tale of soaring brilliance, heart-wrenching decisions and the weight of human destiny. Prepare to be moved as we delve into the profound legacy of J. Robert Oppenheimer. J. Robert Oppenheimer, also known as the father of the atomic bomb, is the subject of Christopher Nolan's breathtaking film Oppenheimer, which packs a monumental paradigm change into three eerie hours. It brilliantly traces the tumultuous life of the American theoretical physicist who contributed to the development of the atomic bomb that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki during the World War II, cataclysms that ushered the era of human dominance. The film is based on Kai Bird and Martin J. Sherwin's comprehensive biography of J. Robert Oppenheimer. Published in 2005, Nolan's screenplay and direction heavily rely on the book as it covers Oppenheimer's life and career, including his involvement with the Manhattan Engineer District and the infamous Manhattan Project. The war in the Pacific was finally over thanks to the work of him and many other brilliant scientists of the time, who he oversaw as director of a secret weapon lab constructed in a nearly desolate stretch of Los Alamos, New Mexico. Oppenheimer's legacy is shaped by the atomic bomb and the destruction it caused, and this film reflects that. There are no documentary images of the dead or panoramas of cities in flame. These choices can be seen as Nolan's ethical absolutes, but he does not restage the attacks. The picture is saturated with the horrors of the bombing, the enormity of the misery they inflicted, and the subsequent armaments race. While Nolan's filmmaking in Oppenheimer is crucially in service to the history that it depicts, the picture is a remarkable formal and conceptual achievement in its own right. The drama begins in 1920s with Oppenheimer as a young adult and continues through the decades as he ages and his hair becomes grey all the while played by Killian Murphy with a feverish intensity. The film covers his professional life, including his work on the bomb, the controversy that followed him, the anti-communist attack that almost destroyed him, and the friendships and romances that kept him going but also caused him stress. After having an affair with political firebrand Jean Tatlock, he marries big willing boozer Kitty Harrison, who follows him to Los Alamos and gives birth to their second child. Nolan, who has long celebrated the adaptability of the film medium, has given this dense, event-filled drama a complex framework, which he divides into illuminating portions. Some are black and white with strong contrast, but the majority are in full color. These pieces are laid out in strands that spiral together to form a shape reminiscent of a double helix, such as that found in DNA. He uses the words fission and fusion to brand the film with his idea, and Nolan being Nolan, he repeatedly kings up the overarching chronology. It's also not a plot that builds slowly, instead Nolan plunges you headfirst into Oppenheimer's existence at various points in time, depicting in stunning detail. The plot quickly cuts between the present day and the 1920s where he is a troubled student plagued by burning apocalyptic visions, and the older Oppie keeps a careful eye on everything. As he endures anguish, he also encounters T.S. Eliot's The Waste Land, Stravinsky's The Rite of Spring, and a Picasso painting, each a landmark creation from an era when physics collapsed space and time into a single dimension. As Nolan continues to flesh out this cubistic portrayal, he travels back and forth across continents introducing legions of individuals, including Niels Bohr, a physicist who had a hand in the Manhattan Project. Nolan has crammed the film with recognizable actors like Matt Damon, Robert Downey Jr. and Gary Oldman, and it shows Benny Safdie as Edward Teller, the theoretical physicist renowned as the father of hydrogen bomb, and Rami Malek is in the film too. The world becomes clearer as Oppenheimer does. After studying quantum physics in 1920s Germany, he spends the following decade at Berkeley as a professor, where he serves as a sounding board for the other young minds and helps establishing a research institute dedicated to the field. There is, as one might imagine, a large lot of scientific argument and chalkboard packed with bewildering equations, most of which Nolan translates quite comprehensively. And the era's intellectual energy is made real by Nolan. Einstein presented his theory of general relativity in 1915. Getting a taste of the dynamic energy of intellectual dialogue through the film's characters is a treat. 
The news of the German invasion of Poland changes the course of Oppenheimer's life irrevocably when he is a student at Berkeley. By the time he befriends Ernest Lawrence, a physicist who plays a pivotal role in Manhattan Project as the inventor of a particle accelerator called Cyclotron. Oppenheimer meets the project's military head Leslie Groves, and Groves eventually promotes him to the position of director at Los Alamos despite the fact that Oppenheimer has a history of supporting leftist causes and has had close ties to the Communist Party through his brother Frank. In terms of both themes and production value, Nolan is unique among working filmmakers today. Nolan has filmed with 65mm film projected in 70mm with the help of his excellent cinematographer Hoyt Van Hoytema, a format he has employed before to achieve a feeling of cinematic monumentality. The effect can be impressive if a bit crushing at times, especially when the spectacle ends up being more impressive and consistent than the plot. The technique is used to great effect in Oppenheimer as it was in Dunkirk to depict the scale of world-defining event and to bring you closer to Oppenheimer whose face becomes both vista and mirror. The film's virtuosity shines through in every shot, but it never becomes conceited or boastful. Attempts to do honor to significant historical figures or even events might backfire if the filmmaker themselves steals the spotlight. This is a pitfall that Nolan successfully sidesteps by placing Oppenheimer, especially in the black and white sequences, firmly into a broader context. Both parts focus on the confirmation of Louis Strauss, the former chairman of the United States Atomic Energy Commission, who was nominated for a cabinet position in 1950. His reputation has been damaged by a politically motivated security clearance hearing in 1954. Strauss's position in the hearing and his connection with Oppenheimer significantly affected the conclusion of the confirmation. Thus, Nolan uses sequences from both the hearing and the confirmation to create a dialectical synthesis between black and white and color portions. One of the most compelling applications of this strategy is to shed light on the existential clarity with which scientists like J. Robert Oppenheimer, who were Jewish and four to flee Nazi Germany viewed the job. Even though Oppenheimer is a genius, he is nonetheless a victim of political gamesmanship. The vanity of petty characters and the naked anti-Semitism of the Red Panic, despite his qualification, international reputation and devotion to United States government throughout the war. The final third of Oppenheimer is dominated by these all-black scenes. They have a tendency to drag on and this section of the film makes it feel as if Nolan is getting carried away by the drama. Surrounding the struggles of America's most famous scientist. As Nolan completes his portrait of a man who exemplified the intersection of science and politics, including in his role as a communist boogeyman, who was transformed by his role in the creation of weapons of mass destruction and soon after raised the alarm about the dangers of nuclear war. All the film's complexities and many fragments finally come together. Francois Truffaut once wrote that war films, even pacifist, even the best, willingly or not, glorify war and render it in some way attractive. This, I think, gets at why Nolan Nolan refuses to show the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, world-defining events that eventually killed an estimate of 100,000 to upwards of 200,000 souls. You do, though, see Oppenheimer watch the first test bomb, and critically, you also hear the famous words that he said cross his mind as the mushroom cloud rose. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. As Nolan reminds you, the world quickly moved on from the horrors of the war to embrace the bomb. Now we too have become death, the destroyers of the world. As we reach the end of this poignant journey, we hope Oppenheimer's story reminds us of the complexities of human nature and the consequences of our choices. If you found this exploration as moving as we did, don't forget to like and share this video. To continue discovering more captivating stories from history and literature, subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell. Thank you for joining us on this emotional odyssey into the triumph and tragedy of Oppenheimer. Until we meet again, may the pages of history continue to inspire and enlighten us all. Farewell.